We're doing this series called Faith and Culture. It's a pretty cool background, right? It's pretty cool. And our main scripture for this series is found in John 1.17, which says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we've been trying to unpack this and what it actually looks like in our life. How it changes our theology, our religion of how we understand scripture and then how we live out and how we apply the word of God and how the spirit of God should move through us as he fills us and leads us, and how we engage in society, how we engage in relationships, how we deal with the things of life, whether hard, good, the struggles, the pain, the abuse, the work, the joys, the the love, all of it. And we're trying to be as sincere as possible of understanding that today, how many of you are from all different backgrounds? How many of us are new to the church? How many of you are listening online today or here and you're visiting or you've been coming a little while and you're like, I'm not too sure about this Jesus thing. And we understand that we can talk about what's going on in culture and the things in the world And man, it can strike a nerve because it's personal, because we're living in it. We're going through it. And God understands and sees it. And God's not beating you up with rules. If that's your perspective of God, that's not who God is. He's not this cosmic judge on a throne, you know, somewhere in space, looking down, ready to just, scold us in our sin or in our mistakes or in our trouble or even in our struggle. That's not the God we love. That's not the creator. That's not who he is. He loves us. He knows us. The Bible says he knows every single hair on our head. Listen, me and my head of hair are like this. I have no clue. No idea. The Bible says that he knit us together in our mother's womb. And he knew our innermost thoughts. And he put forth the purpose and the plan for our lives. He loves us. He knows us. He created us. And today, I even, I wanted to just jump in. I really do want to talk about the things of culture. I've been studying for years and months, especially the weeks leading up to this. And I really felt God this week, especially yesterday and today, saying, It's not time. See, I wanted to talk about all these hot cultural topics. But I believe God is saying, not yet. They're not ready. We're not ready. We need more of the foundational understanding and truth that we stand on. I understand things or I try to understand the things of God whether the word of God the Holy Spirit in practical ways. I think of my children got my little four-year-old and my little one-and-a-half-year-old. They are capable of so much. 
they're going to be, they're going to know so much. And I just get practical. And I think of mathematics and how my son, at the very least, is going to have pre-calculus in his blood, right? At the very least, have that understanding. But now he doesn't even know two plus three. And that's not an insult to him. And it would be harmful for me or for God or for anybody else to throw pre-calculus at him. But to say, no, no, the next step to build upon. A lot of times, we are just trying our best to understand this world we live in. All of the uncertainties, the unknown things, trying our best to live a good life. For those of us in this room and hearing my voice, the majority of us are trying to love God, to be a follower of Jesus, and to have the life he promised us. But we need to build it. We need to understand who God is and who we are as a church, who we are as the body of Christ. So see, I'm not here today as a political pundit. I'm not a social media influencer. My wife will say amen to that. <laughs> I'm not even a cultural savant that comes to share my opinion on what's going on in the world and what we can do to make it better. That's not who I am. I'm called by God. And I don't say that lightly. To be a shepherd of his people. Who is called to teach and demonstrate the kingdom of God. And the rule of Christ in this house. Plain and simple. So what that means is we stand on the word of God. Not by just proclaiming it, but by ingesting it. By knowing it. By wrestling with it. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible before. But if anybody, if you're at home and if you read it before, sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know about that one, God. That's a little difficult. Not too sure if I can do, I'm not too sure if I understand that. So it's a process of growing in him. To have a faith that is real and that is tangible. And to be part of a body of Christ, to be part of his church, with Jesus loves. Jesus called and put the church forth on the earth. He calls us his bride. Think about that. That's who we are to Jesus. Ephesians 3.10 says this. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This, this is like the ultimate scripture in Ephesians. Right there in the middle. It encompasses what this book, what this letter that Paul wrote 2,000 years ago was all about. And if you know this, the history of this letter, many believe that it's not actually to the Ephesian church, which today is in Turkey. 
Ephesus. If you know the New Testament, after the Gospels and after the book of Acts, come a collection of letters that were penned mostly by Paul and a few others. He writes them specifically to churches that he built up, whether in, you know, the Colossians, the Philippians, the Corinthians, and Rome. He writes these letters. But in this letter, it's not like the others. It's not as personal. There's no names or references to people he knew or situations that they're specifically going through. Earliest manuscripts of the book of Ephesians, of this letter, actually have in the beginning, in Ephesians 1.1, where it says to Ephesus, it's actually not there. What they believe is that this letter was distributed to all different towns and provinces in all different cities. There's even some manuscripts that it's blank because they believed that they would write whatever town they were giving it to, they would write their name in it and giving it to them. Why am I saying this? Because when it says, now through the church, he's not talking to people from 2,000 years ago. He's talking to us. And uh, let me just fast forward to verse 21. It says, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So this scripture is ours. Like the rest, but this is personal. It, Paul writes it to the body of Christ for us to understand and to glean from it. And what I love is he doesn't say, let's read it again. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom, the many, many, right? The layers and layers and layers of God's wisdom should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the world. Is that what it says? Not a trick question. Is that what it says? No. Where Authorities and rulers where? And that, this is how much we are the bride of Christ. That we are the cosmic church. Our role is not just on this earth, in our home or in our neighborhoods or online. God believes in us so much, He has given us a voice in the heavenly realms to speak with authority to those in authority. In realms, in a spiritual realm. I know some of you are like, ah, now you're just losing me. But listen, the church, the church is God's heart. We, we, together make up the body of Christ who now are not just joint heirs in the kingdom of God, but now we have a role for all of eternity that speak into the spiritual realms and the authorities on this earth and over this earth. We don't just speak to the natural things in this world. We don't just fight natural fights. Actually, it's quite to the contrary. If we just fight with the flesh, we produce only what the flesh can produce. And that's what we see going on in this world today. We might have a good cause. We might even have the right reasons. 
But if the way we engage isn't the kingdom, like Bishop was talking last week, if we don't raise our eyes and see the way God sees and speak the way God speaks and act the way Jesus acts, if we don't become truly his followers, what will we end up producing? How about if I put it this way? If my grandparents had four kids and they raised up, three of them became Christians, became followers of Jesus. And then my parents had four kids and they raised them up and two of them became followers of Jesus. And then me, and my wife had four kids, and one of them became a follower of Jesus. And then my son had four kids. How many would be followers of Jesus? If that was the trajectory of my family line for the last hundred years, how many of you would blame society for what my family has produced? How many of you would blame the internet or movies or the school? Would anybody here be like, hey, those influences are real. But to get to the heart of the matter, we need to look at your grandparents or your great-grandparents or you. Do you know that Barna Research, one of the most reputable and trusted Christian researchers in the United States, has concluded that Christianity is at an irrevocable I can't even say the word, irrevocable decline in the United States. That means it cannot be turned around. We are at such a point with what we have birthed in our generations that within the last four generations, we've gone from about three quarters to four fifths, 75 to 80 percent Christians to now what we're looking at about 20%. And now there is no legislature. There is no law. There is no teaching that they're saying can turn it around. It is on a steep decline. But as we look at that, we want to put the blame on them, whoever them is in your world, in your perception. We want to blame this world. And we want to blame, 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 blame. But just like my family history, we have to look here. It's the same thing with the church. Now, here's the good news. You're like, Pastor Mark, oh man, I was feeling good after worship. Pastor Mike, bring Pastor Mike back out. <laughs> but here's the reality, and here's the good news. I said, no law. I said, no man can turn it around. There's no system in which now we can create that can turn it around. There is no moral compass, no legislation, no education or teaching that can turn it around. Only an authentic move of God. Yeah. Only an authentic move. Some would dare to call it an awakening, like we've seen before in this country. Some use the words revival, 
which means for God's spirit to come. And to come in a way that he came 2,000 years ago. And you're like, man, but that's old. Some of you are studying Acts in your small groups. Am I right? You're reading it and what are you? You're like, what? If you never read it, you're like, what? Man, that was crazy back then. Man, I wish that would happen today. You know it is happening today? It's just not happening here. But around the world, do you know there are more Muslims in Muslim countries coming to Jesus, not because of missionaries. This is crazy. I have a feed, I I forget what it is on Instagram. I get these videos constantly of Muslims that are now believers in Christ, even if it means imprisonment, death, or excommunication from their families in these Muslim countries. And you wanna know how they're coming to the Lord? Jesus is visiting them. They're having dreams and vision. And in this vision, Jesus is literally speaking to them. And they're having these encounters like Paul had on the road to Damascus. And they're coming to the Lord. More than we've ever seen in the history. This is bananas. You read about the Chinese church. And what they... If they're found with the Bible, they'll go to prison for three years, in some places even worse. But three years in prison. So you know what they do once they go to prison? People come visit them, and they bring them little pieces of paper with a chapter written down. And what they do is they memorize it. They memorize it, they memorize it, they memorize it. So there are Christians in China without a Bible that literally have chapters and books memorized. In America, we average two Bibles per home and we don't read any of them. And then we wonder why. Or we think that the kingdom of God is going to come through who we vote for in November. Don't get me wrong. I am a citizen of this country. I will vote. I will use the word of God. I will use prayer. And I would use discernment and understanding of what's going on to put my vote to the best use possible. But solutions? What's that? (laughs) Nobody there. So when I read this scripture, I'm going to read it again. Listen to it. Because this isn't just a nice scripture. This is who you are if you call yourself a follower of Jesus. This is who you can be if you're wondering. And you may have been like, man, but the church doesn't look much like that. And I'm struggling. I understand but God is faithful, and it's his church. It's not our church. It's not my church. His intent, God's desire, God's mandate, his purpose was that now, today, right in this moment, as we breathe, through the church, through us, through you, through all of us, not through the pulpit only, Not through Pastor Mike and witness counseling. Not through Alpha and what's going on with Pastor Brandon. I got to say Pastor Brandon for the first time. Look at that. Okay. Not that's part of it. But now through the church, that's you, every son, every daughter, every believer, the manifold wisdom, the understanding of God, the revelation of God. The solutions of God. Grace and truth of God walking perfectly out as an example to the world should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. 
See, Paul prays a prayer. Another unique thing about Ephesians is the first three chapters are mostly a prayer. This is Paul praying. Here is how he prays. And then I want to break this down with the last few minutes I have. Because Paul puts out a prayer of petition for us, for his church. In verse 14, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. In verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long, and high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. To him be the glory, his bride and the groom throughout all generations. I want to break down the four that's. See, that there can be, you can break it down even further, but I'm going to break down these four petitions with the word that. So the first petition is to strengthen the inner man. In chapter, in verse 16, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's a promise. That's what God has for us. That our inner being. See, there is in the Bible, we talk about flesh, which isn't the, necessarily just the body. It's the fallen nature. It's the sin, it's the, the things that we do that we don't want to do, and, and all of that, that's the flesh. But when he talks about the innermost being, he's talking about our soul and our spirit. When we were created, like Pastor Mike said in Genesis, and God breathed his breath, his spirit, his life into us and set us apart from everything else in creation. He said mankind is created in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. This innermost being can be strengthened can come alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a daily walk. But it's something we shouldn't give up on. It's something that as we stumble, we make mistakes. Sometimes we feel we're not good enough. Man, I can't believe I did that again. That's right. Because... We need Jesus. Yes. And there is no shame or no guilt or no condemnation that can separate you from the love of God, the Bible says. Yes. So we can be strengthened in our inner man by the Spirit of God. 
What do you think was happening up here? Or back there, or at home. When Pastor Mike said, there's anxiety in your body. There's fear. There are these things that are robbing you of your peace and your joy. Why hold on to it? Bring it to the Father. Bring it to the Father. And may he strengthen you with his power through his spirit. And that's the process. Number two, the second petition. Paul prays for the indwelling Christ. Right? In 17, he says, so that, there's that word that again, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There's an indwelling Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of his presence. The hope that I can overcome my past, my situation, my abuse, my pain, my unforgiveness, my actions. Christ in me, that he can give me a purpose and I can tap into who he created me to be. That I can have the mind of Christ There is no formula. If there was a formula, we would go back to the law. We would go back to the Old Testament and just preach. And listen, the Old Testament is rich and full. God didn't do away with it. He fulfilled it. See, this indwelling of Jesus I have here it says a person may be in Christ and thus live in the spirit and in the power of the living Lord who indwells to indwell means to be permanently present in someone's mind body or soul so when we hear that word indwell it means to be permanent God just doesn't want to come and then leave. Jesus just doesn't want to say, okay, come on, I'm with you today, and then leave. Dr. James Stewart, a Scottish revivalist and preacher, he says this, the eternal lives in every instance. You must receive it. And I am sure that at any instant in the day, God may present in us the living Christ. He might present in us as the living Christ. Meaning, he's saying, the living God, he's with us. He is every single moment of the day. The presence, the spirit, God is here. And he wants to indwell and always be in us and not leave. Thus, at any moment as we live our life, as we're home with our families, as we're at school, at work, at the grocery store, whether we're on social media, no matter what we're doing, God has the opportunity to then come out of us and through us show the love of Christ and the hope of Christ and the truth of Christ to people around us. What an incredible thought. What an incredible truth. This is who Jesus is in my life. This is who Jesus is. Let me hurry. The third one. The third petition is the boundless dimensions of Christ's love. Boundless. Can you say boundless? 
Come on, say boundless. In 17b, it says, and I pray that you, there's that that again, right? I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. Man, that's a sermon right there. Are we rooted and established in love? Because if we are, hate has no place. And guess what happens sometimes? A weed might come. I have these monster weeds in my backyard. They are ridiculous. They literally run in the ground, and some of them are this thick. They run up over rocks, up the trees. They're strangling the trees. I mean, they are crazy. We can't do anything about it because it would cost as much as the house to actually, actually excavate the land to get these weeds out because they've been rooted for so long. But in Christ Jesus, I'm a new creation. There is, he paid the greatest cost. So he comes in, he's like, yeah, you don't have money to excavate this. I'll take care of it like this. And he can come and take out those roots, those vines that so easily entangle us. That's what it says in Romans, right? So now, verse 18 may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. See, we're together. This isn't about you being by yourself. This isn't a self-help teaching here so you can go home and get your life right by doing a couple steps. This is us, the body of Christ, together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp. See, I need help grasping this love. When unforgiveness comes in my heart, I need my brothers and sisters with me to help me grasp how deep and how wide and how wide his love truly is. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. We're letting knowledge, not wisdom, reign supreme in our culture. As we dig and eat and unearth and uncover and bring to life the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we want to hail that as the solutions of this world, realizing deeper and deeper it goes, more and more chaotic things seem to get. But this is Paul's petition, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all of us what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know this love and to act in this love, to speak with this love, to be a church that is known for its love, not for its just judgment. The fourth petition. This is the penultimate, right, statement he makes at the end of this prayer here. This fourth petition. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Can you close your eyes for me for one second? Close your eyes. If you feel comfortable, just put your hands out and receive this. God, I pray that your sons and daughters will be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That we wouldn't be lacking nothing when it comes to grace and hope and wisdom, and understanding, love. That we will be filled to the full measure of who you are, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. This is Paul's prayer for us. This is what God's asking us to step into, to wrestle with, 
to read, to study, to understand, to link arms in your life groups or sign up for a life group, to get together with your worship team, not just to practice chords and sing in harmony, but to be brothers and sisters together and to be known as disciples of Jesus. How does the Bible say they took note that they were disciples of Jesus? By their what? By their love. By their love. So you might ask, what is our response to what's going on in the world today? Wars and refugees, greed and lies, deceit, sexual immorality, and so much more. Did you see the heartbreak of what's going on in the Middle East? Innocent people on both sides being killed and slaughtered. What is your response? What is the church's statement? What do you believe? What, what are you going to say? Can I say a couple things? One is, why do we always have to have a statement? Why do we think our voice matters so much? My opinion. Why do we elevate the opinion of man to where we agree with it so quickly or we become so disenfranchised with it that we want to cancel people. I'm so tired of people having to post stuff just because something's going on, just to like cover their backs. Oh, they had to say something, so they, you know, so they put a little picture up. Oh, we're praying for these people. Man, please. Or we get offended. Oh, my church didn't put up a post for Hispanic Month. Where's that? They did something for African American Month and not Hispanic Month. See, the, the, man. Here, you want to know my thoughts? My thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts are the Word of God. Turn with me. Just listen, listen, before you clap, before you clap, because this might be a little setup. Turn to Romans 12, verse 9. If you've never read Romans 12, woo! So I'm going to start in verse 9 just because of time. This should be our response. This should be our Twitter feed. This should be populating all of the words that fill up the paper. This should be what's going on. Any, this should be what's pouring out of our heart in real ways with the people, no matter what's going on. Whether it's the Gaza Strip, the Ukraine, New Haven, my home, your school. Love must be sincere. Thou preach. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. This is my favorite. Be joyful in hope. Patience in affliction. Patience in affliction and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You have time today to take down your posts, okay? Take those curses down. Take them down. You got time today, okay? It's never too late. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. 
Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of any, everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. <laughs> Listen to this. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. <clears throat> Stop taking the Lord's will into your own hands. And then it says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, this is why we lift our eyes. I don't expect our government or any other government to truly embrace this. That's why my hope is not in the government. I don't think some group is going to truly live by this. It is the calling of the church to say this is who we are. This is who we are. Yeah, I know whatever the world's saying, this is how I'm going to love. This is how I'm going to live. This is now how the manifold wisdom of God comes through the church. And you say, well, they said before it was in the heavenly realms and principalities with, you know, darkness and stuff. If we do all this, what does it say? You will overcome evil with good. You will defeat. What is evil? The enemy. The spirit of darkness, which is moving on this earth. How do we combat that? We just read it. Will we take it home? Will we meditate on this? Will we try to apply it? Whether it's to our sister, our brother, our cousin, or our worldview. And I loved how he closes this in this little doxology. It's a short hymn of praise to God in Ephesians 320, not to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him who is able to do immeasurably more. How within us? To him be the glory in the church. That glory is his presence, his peace. We understand to him be the glory in Christ Jesus, the anointed one. But it says, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. I'm ready for a ride. I'm ready for the pouring out of God's spirit. I'm ready for the church to finally wake up from the American dream and all of its comforts and distractions, all of the prosperity and just the blessings that have produced what we see today. Not that some of that stuff's bad. Let me do a little caveat. But to us, it's time for the Spirit of God. It's time for Jesus to rise up in us. No longer should we be satisfied with coming to church on Sunday or coming to church 1.2 Sundays a month. It's time for us to be the church. 
It's time to believe what God did there 2,000 years ago. It's time to believe what God did and is doing in China and in India and throughout Muslim countries and in Africa. What God is doing in pockets throughout the United States. What God did in Ashbury at a university with college students. He's going to raise up throughout this land and throughout this church a fire, a revival, an awakening. Maybe for some of us, but I believe a lot of us are alive. We don't necessarily need revival, but we need the spirit of revival to come in and flow out of this house so that thousands will see and know and hear and experience the love and the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. Stand up with me. Grab the hand of the person next to you. See, some of you, you know there's prayer tomorrow night down the street at the gym. Some of you know there's prayer there. Some of you know that that prayer closet at your house needs to be opened. Some of you know that you have an encouraging word in you to share with the people next to you that need uplifting. I loved how Pastor Mike didn't just call pastors to pray for those on, at the altar. He said, any of you that have authority, any of you that have an anointing, any of you that have a faith, come and pray and lay hands. What you do in here, what you hear in here, what you practice in here, what you experience in here, let's do out there. Bow your heads and begin to pray. Whatever it is that's stuck out to you today, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord God, that you are not giving up on us. And we thank you that whatever mama did or daddy did or that ex did, that none of it can control me any longer, can control us any longer. I am not defined by my mistakes. We are not defined by what somebody did to us. We are not defined by the color of our skin or how much money is in our bank account. We are not defined by the lies of the enemy. We are not defined by the understanding of this world. Lord God, it's only you through Christ Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit that we say come, that we say we make room. We give you the insecurities. We give you the past. We give you the struggles. We give you the desires. We give you the passion. We give you the bank account. We give you the time. And we ask that this is just the beginning of what you have for us and your church. I pray right now, intercessors are birthed right now Awaken right now, intercessors in this house, people that will pray, not for themselves, but for others. We speak it right now. We speak for your truth and your revelation, your understanding to change hearts and minds in this house and those listening online. 
Will you allow your narrative, your perspective, your reality, will you term as your truth? Will you allow it to kneel at the foot of the cross? Will you allow your thinking, your actions, your opinions to kneel at the supremacy of Christ Jesus and His Word? Lord God, we give it to You. And we thank You, Jesus. We thank You that we are more than conquerors. We thank you, Jesus, that nothing can separate us from your love. We thank you, Lord God, that there's no height nor depth nor width. There's no mountain. There's no bottom of the ocean. There is nothing. There's no knowledge, no teaching of this world. There's nothing from the enemy that is greater than your love, greater than your ways, greater than your truth. Just begin to declare it over you and your family. And we speak that right now. We declare it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night at prayer. If you want to come to Alpha on Wednesday, you don't have to register. Just come on in. 7 p.m. We love you. Have a wonderful week.